everybody! Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always is my fabulous ho- co-host, inventor and genius... <gasps> it's me, Diana! That's an inside joke. And my other fabulous co-host, who is neither inventor, but maybe a genius... <laughs> Not uh, at all a genius, Jackie! Hey, everybody! <laughs> How's it going? It's great. It's fine. We're doing good. We're great. Pretty busy Everyone's inventing here. and you know thinking yeah, about things. It's so. pretty tough. Thinking and inventing. But this isn't an invention podcast unless the inventions are the inventions of our minds in discussing behavior analytic research, which is actually what we talk about every I other week on our I don't believe in the show. mind. What yeah. is the mind, I mean, Rob? I'm, I'm speaking of it as an allusion to other inferior works about writing. It's a metaphor, guys. It's a metaphor. Carry on. Anyway. Today, we are going to be talking about the ever-exciting topic of contingencies. Specifically, do humans actually prefer when contingencies are in play, or would they rather just be given things freely? Freeloading. Freeloaders. I do love to be freeloaded. But do you You really? You think you do. I might not. But do you? I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. That's true. I think if, if told I... Can I do nothing and get something? I suppose like you can get money for just sitting on your butt. That sounds really good. But if given a real experimentally controlled situation in which I had to pick between doing something for money or just receiving money for nothing, I wonder what would the results be? So you want to get your money for nothing? But your chicks for free? Oh, my chips for free is what I want. <laughs> I think I want chips for free, too. I, <laughs> I love chips. We all love chips. I think that really is what brings us together is and how I, much we love chips. And yeah. I want them for free. I don't want to do anything for them. No. I want them to be put I in my want mouth. Un- I want unlimited, unlimited chips. And salsa. Yeah. And free guac. I'm going to do an episode where I just eat chips on microphone. Yeah. And I'll see who downloads it's it. very avant-garde. Do you, do you prefer loud crunching sounds in your microphone? If so... You download this episode. Anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about the articles we'll be discussing tonight. Let's do it. Or today, whichever whichever time of day you're listening to the show. We are going to be reading two... Well, we read them already. We're going to be discussing two articles. And they are Evaluation of Client Preference for Function-Based Treatment Packages by Hanley, Piazza, Fisher, Contrucci, and Maglieri from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1997. The best year in music that wasn't a year with the Beatles. It's according to the AV Club, folks. That's not just me. Hey, AV. Why? Weezer? What? I think Pinkerton <laughs> might have come out that year. But Green Day? I was uh, 17. I think, oh, I, think 90, I think I think 94 was the best year for music is no, what it's sounding o- like. Odelay came out in 97, I believe. Okay. Uh, I love that rope dog. <laughs> Which was that? He's jumping over a oh, hurdle oh, yeah, I thought on the a, cover. I thought it was a stack of hay. He's a rope dog. No. I love those dogs. It's right. like a broom, like a mop. I'm going to use my two turntables and a microphone to talk about our second article, which Fine. is, do children prefer contingencies? Hmm? An evaluation of the efficacy of and preference for contingent versus non-contingent social reinforcement during play by Luzinski and Hanley, also from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, but from 2009, which is not the best year in music. No. I could not name a song that came out in 2009. White Stripes. Oh, good job, Diana. Did they? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really she pinpoint the year. It's really the feeling of that half of the decade that I go with. Uh, okay. Sounds good. So why don't we get started, Jackie, by talking about the original 97 article, because as Diana mentioned to me when I was saying, oh, I should have read the 2009 first. I don't remember why I was saying this. She said, but you have to have read the 1997 article first or you won't understand the 2009 article. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, okay. I love it. So this article, I think, is one of the seminal articles on client choice. Does it sound okay? Am I close? Am I far? You sound fine. Great. You know, I just want to get it. Closer. The, the close. The problem is the closer you get, get on it to up your in mouth, there. the more distorted it becomes, you know, even though it is louder. I just like it better that way. But that's okay. We're here. We're here and we're fine. <laughs> we're better than fine. We're so good. We're great. Um, this anyway. actually is one of my favorite articles. Yeah, it's a great article. I think it's one of these seminal articles. And I think this article and these articles surrounding this topic of human pre- uh, human preference. But yeah, I guess human preference of well, contingencies. 
we're, humans. We're, it's we just, are it's actually about just humans. preference. Organism preference, but right. that sounds way not catchy. But yeah. we're talking about two articles in which the participants were all humans. So I think we right. could they honestly were. say we're talking about human preference and human preference only right now. Okay. Yes, but right. this research is standing on the backs of previous research that right. was not done with humans. They're not. They didn't. They didn't make the cut into this awesome episode. <laughs> okay, but yeah. So but yeah, organism. Let's just we'll just say human. Let's say human. Okay, okay. So, but one thing I love about this, I think these these collection of articles really turned the corner for behavior analysis. You know, we were going we were going straight ahead. We're like, yeah, things work. Yeah, things work. Yeah, we're awesome. Yeah, we're awesome. And then we're like, hey, we're awesome, but let's also take into account. Our, our our clients and ask them what they prefer and that i think was like a Meh. is it a hard right when people say that hard right people you say could, that you could say that okay like a hard right like oh now we're veering off we're still going to be effective a hard oh, veer hard veer nobody says a hard veer <laughs> that is not a saying <laughs> but anyway i think Do your fork in the road voice right get it fork in the road ah! <laughs> oh my goodness waka, waka, waka. right so we already knew that we could make effective treatments right. that decreased problem behavior and were socially significant. Mm-hmm. But what if you had two treatments? They were also both effective. The next question to ask, which Hanley and colleagues thought to ask was, well, which one does the client prefer? Right. And I think this is good. And right around the 97s, early 2000s, um, this is where um, they started looking at person-centered treatments. So in the early 2000s, um, late 90s, this idea that clients should be included in their own treatment started to come about in, in other areas of psychology, not just in behavior analysis. So I think this was good that we were going with the trends um, and following along with other lines and taking into account client preference. So I just think it's pretty awesome that this happened. So is this one of the earlier articles where you see the kind of concurrent reinforcement schedule linked pre- kind of preference? Treatment preference really came into came into being as something that you sort of add to your article, right? I think so. Yeah. So this is one in of the, the context of, of of preference analyzing and... treatment. Yes. 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 The concurrent I, I chains arra- arrangement has been yes. present for a long time, but usually in the context of choice. But literature. as a component, but as a component of looking at yeah client preference, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so here we had two treatments. Um, so we had functional communication training where the reinforcer was identified that maintained the problem behavior and that was contingent, uh, delivered contingent on an alternative behavior that was functional. Usually it's a (laughs) communicative response. And then the other treatment that they looked at was non-contingent reinforcement. Remember we talked about that. It's not really reinforcement because it's a reinforcer delivered on a time-based schedule. Right. Irrespective. Is that a word? It is not. But I always use it. Wrongly. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Irrespective. It's just... Just time-based schedule. The reinforcers delivered on a time-based schedule regardless of the behavior of the behaviors occurring. Oh, or not. my bad. Irrespective is a word. Irregardless is not a word. Oh, yeah. so you threw me. I know. By using both of them yes. together. Okay, while we're on this tangent, while we're on this tangent, I feel like we had an episode a long time ago where Jackie, I think it was generalizability, you said is not a word. It is a word. But it is a word. It actually I've seen it in is like a word. Three articles since then. No, it is a word. And I didn't think it was a word. And then we were in a the thesis defense yeah. and they're like, is that a word? And we looked it up and it actually is a word. But we don't technically use that because we use the broader word generality. But which- I've seen it. In recent articles, because the only reason I thought of it, I was like, wait a minute. I think yeah. the first one was like a, a you know an author I hadn't read before, but then there was another, and it was like, that's a name. That's a name author of generalizability. I must not be crazy. You're not crazy. Hooray. No, it's well, a I mean, real word. Not for that reason. Yeah. It's a real word. I just don't think we use it a ton, but. We don't. So it might be time for someone to do a nice behavior analyst thought paper on, on generalization generalizability and generalization one more time one more time to um, set the record straight for everyone in the field yeah because the last article that they did that was in 1979 by johnston i think yeah so that's a long time ago it's time we should do one with a um i forget the citation but uh when the authors looked at the words sort of they looked i think some sort of search engine to see what words do people have you know negative connotations for oh yeah and they should say which one generality generalizability which one of those do people tend to be like Ugh, i hate that word or it makes me not trust mm-hmm. you and then we should stop using that word and use the other one instead okay 
I like that idea. There we go. Look at that. So copyright me, everybody. I'm your second <laughs> author if you write it. Copyright Sorry. Rob. Rob Heracruz. All right. So anyway, Hanley and colleagues wanted to investigate the effectiveness of the two function-based treatments, NCR and FCT, for two clients who had behavior that was sensitive to adult attention. And then following the demonstration that both of these treatments were effective, they used a modification of a concurrent change procedure based on Hernstein in 1964 to evaluate the client's preference for the two treatments. So they're like, yes, it works. Now which one do you like better? So they had two individuals with severe problem behavior. Um, They were admitted to an inpatient unit specializing in the assessment and treatment of destructive behavior. Tony was a four-year-old boy and Carla was an eight-year-old girl. Both of them were diagnosed with developmental disabilities and had limited communication skills. So before they did anything else, they ran a functional analysis. They used a multi-element design. Uh, They were looking to assess the maintaining variable for these problem behavior. So they use a social attention condition similar to the Iwata and colleagues 1982-1994 session. So sessions were 10 minutes long. I've never heard of it. Yeah, right? So in 1997, Greg Hanley was doing the multi-element design and not the ISCA. Um, <laughs> what, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> More than a decade before he actually wrote the paper describing right. the ISCA? He wasn't using it already? Nope, not yet. Um, so they ran a social attention condition. <laughs> I'm um, imagining a Back to the Future movie where Greg Hanley goes back right. in time. He's like, no! You know that new treatment you've been looking for? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that would be amazing. Um, so they ran a social attention session. They ran a, a demand session where the therapist used sequential verbal gestural and physical prompts until the client either complied or engaged in destructive behavior. They also ran a tangible session and a play session and what they found was jackie what they find what they found was was it the function that you described at the beginning of your discussion of this article yes they found <laughs> that for tony destructive behavior only occurred in the social attention condition and not in the tangible demand or toy play condition and for carla um during the multi-element analysis they had some different effects, so they saw responding across a variety of things, um, and so then they ripped that apart and did a sequential pairwise analysis. Ripped it Sounds apart. Violent. Yeah, just, like, it just does. like in last last our last episode, in behavior gerontology. Another yeah. pairwise. Mm-hmm. Two pairwise I assessments. Love, I love pairwise analysis. So they looked at the toy play condition and social attention condition, and the toy play condition and the tangible condition, and they saw that again. Destructive behavior was highest in the social attention condition with a minor, minor increase in tangible, the tangible condition. So they looked at assessing the social attention condition. And then they went on to phase two. So they looked at the effects of FCT and NCR on the attention maintained destructive behavior of both clients. They did a combination of a multi-element design and an ABA design. So that's very strong, demonstrating functional control. So they went, they reverted back to baseline with both of the assessments happening. So the baseline condition was similar to the social attention condition. So the client was given toys and instructed to play. Um, and contingent on destructive behavior, the therapist delivered 20 seconds of attention in the form of my favorite, don't do that, you'll hurt yourself. I love don't that. Don't do that, you'll hurt yourself. So... As an aside, we were driving in my car over the week over the weekend, mm-hmm. and my mom was visiting, and she was in the back seat with my daughter, and my daughter's probably teething, and so she was biting on her finger, and my mom was like, "Don't do that! You'll hurt yourself!" <laughs> and I was like, "No, don't, don't say, say that. that. <laughs> Never say but that." But it was awesome because I was like, <gasps> "It was pretty funny." She continued doing it, so <laughs> it didn't work. It wasn't effective. Yeah, so that was baseline, and then during the FC, oh, look at, they did FCT training trials. I love that. Love that. Functional communication training, training trials. (laughs) Um, Trials, trials. Trials, trials. They were conducted to teach the clients alternative responses that would result in access to adult attention. So for Tony, he needed to learn to say the therapist's name or saying play with me, which I bet was cute because he was four, Um, and the alternative response for Carla was giving a card to the therapist. These, so these communica- communicative responses were selected based on um, the individual's expressive language um, repertoire. 
So once they learned how to emit those responses, following the training, they did a little condition where adult attention was only contingent on using the appropriate uh, response and no consequences were provided for destructive behavior, so essentially extinction. And then they did a treatment comparison. So they had stimulus materials included in the treatment sessions were the same as those for baseline, so it looked all the same. But during FCT treatment sessions, the client was placed in a room with the same toys as in baseline, the communication card for Carla and the therapist, and they had a blue laminated poster board set up to help discriminate that this was the FCT blue. condition. Blue. Yep. And then with the NCR condition, it, it ran the exact same way, except there was a red laminated poster board placed red. up. Red. And I also love when people take into consideration when they pick colors for discrimination that they don't pick red and green. Right, because right? that's stopping you go. never know. Oh, no, I was going to say you never know someone might be colorblind. Oh, well, that's true, too. Right? Mm-hmm. But red and blue should be discriminable even if you're colorblind. Oh. So, I always like that. Do you want to know what they found? Eh, no, I'm good. <laughs> be awesome. like, I can guess. I already read no, the article, good. so I'm fine, Jack. Right? You don't need to describe it to me. Everybody's, Not on my account. You know. Right? So what they found was that for both Carla and Tony, destructive responses per minute were high and variable during baseline. But then upon the implementation of both FCT and CR, and NCR, uh, destructive responses um, dramatically increased to near zero levels for both Increased? Treatment. Uh, decrease, sorry. Okay. Decrease. I was going to say that is not an effective treatment. <laughs> yeah, no. Decrease to near zero levels for both treatments, both FCR, FCT and NCR. They did a reversal back to baseline and saw an elevated levels of responding and then went on back to both of those treatments and they saw an immediate decrease in responding for both. Yeah. For both Tony and So based and on Carla. the treatment, they're both they awesome. were, they're results treatments. were identical, right? Yeah, which is fascinating that they both work. That's great. They both work. So mm-hmm. this is you know behavior that seemed, they, they found the function. Right. And they were successfully treating it with either of these two treatments Mm -hmm. which is there is a difference between these two treatments yes there is one you have to do something right so it's a response dependent contingency Mm -hmm. and one you don't yeah yeah, the fct you have to say play with me Mm -hmm. (laughs) or or give over the card and then you get the attention and with the ncr it's a response independent contingency independent of responding did they yoke them i believe they did yeah okay so that's how they also controlled for the level of reinforcement available in the NCR condition is they yoked the amount of reinforcement to the preceding FCT session. So that's something to consider too, right? One right. could be preferred over the other because there was more, atten- more attention, more reinforcement in that condition. So that's how they accounted for that. Right. Yeah. And then the phase three of the study was that they evaluated client preference. So they used a modified concurrent chains procedure. So here... There was equal and independent schedules were arranged for two operands in, a, in the initial lengths. So let's say they had two buttons. One button correspond to the NCR condition. One button correspond to the FCT condition. So they've used this procedure in previous study to evaluate preference. So this is really interesting that they now were moving it forward and evaluating preference of treatment. I yeah, love it. I love it too. Here they had um, three F- three procedures. So they had the FCT procedure, they had the NCR procedure, and extinction procedure. They were available in the terminal link, so that's the end product. The initial links are those buttons, and the terminal links are the things that happen right at the end. So they had a switch press outside the room, and that resulted in two minutes of access into the contingency, whatever contingency was paired with the press. So I what I love is that the colors of the buttons corresponded to the laminated posters. Mm. Right? They made that. I love that, too. Yeah. The blue, the red. Right. So maybe they chose the colors based on the availability of the buttons that they had. Mm -hmm. Because almost all of those big buttons, I would always call them big button. Big buttons, yeah. The blue, Or red red or blue. Oh, I did have a yellow one once. Yeah. And there's a white one, too. So the white one represented extinction. Right. Three switchers were covered. They actually covered them with the construction paper. So they didn't actually have them. Yeah, Never but mind. that's true. And so then they did some training sessions first where the therapist physically guided the 
participant to touch each of the buttons and then they experienced the contingency that followed and then they randomly ordered the switch the switch buttons for each of the different trials and then they allowed the participants then once they acquired the touching of the buttons to choose to choose which button they wanted to press and then to engage in whatever contingency that was there and then each of those conditions just lasted two minutes, right? Right. So there were multiple opportunities within each session. Right. To, they would take them into the room, experience the contingency, come back out, have the buttons present again. Right. So you get more data that way. And it lasted for 10 minutes. Yeah. So overall, what we found was that Tony engaged in higher, higher frequency of switch presses when the FCT condition was the terminal link over the NCR condition or the extinction condition. And so did Carla. Carla also saw higher levels of switch presses when FCT was the consequence or the terminal link versus the extinction and the NCR condition. So what's really neat about here is that we know that both of these are effective, but both to- Tony and Carla preferred um, the FCT condition, so the response-dependent condition. It's so cool. It's so neat that, you know, they took client preference into account. Right. So, you know, a lot of studies that we read stop after they do phase one, they Mm -hmm. do the FA, they determine the function of behavior, which is always a good place to start. They do phase two, they figure out what's the appropriate treatment, they get behavior down to zero, and then they say, our job here is done. We're doing it. And then they throw their paper in the air. Right. (laughs) Woohoo! So I love, love, love this study for doing phase three. Mm -hmm. Because people hadn't done that. Right. They hadn't done it. Before. They hadn't done that. And... It's easy, I think, to think, well, there's no way to know because this is maybe uh, someone who can't really tell me which one they prefer, right? Especially like Carla, who was using a communicative card and not a not a response. Right. How would she be able to tell me? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that did not turn out to be the case at all. So I, I love that they applied this concurrent chains arrangement to this question and were able to see such clear results. So like that in and of itself, no matter what the results were, is super cool. Right. And then they found the same results for both of them, which was that they preferred that their behavior produced the reinforcer rather than they just got the reinforcer for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't wait to talk about these results in Dissemination Station. So cool. I know. One thing I think that would be interesting, too, is to look at what therapists prefer, too, right? Mm -hmm. So the people that are running Mm -hmm. these programs, I, I wonder if... You looked if they preferred one over the other that they'd be more likely to implement it. I don't know. Yeah, but that would be interesting to look at. Yeah, I mean, I've had that. people who, when, when they get when they hear choices of treatments, they really like uh, FCR mm-hmm. or they really like SCT because they like the idea of teaching. You yeah. Know, because most of where I work is in an educational setting. Therefore, most teachers want to teach, and they see that as I'm teaching something as opposed to I'm just letting something happen so that this child behaves, which... You know, people want children to behave, but not necessarily at the cost of being able to be educated in in a new skill. Right. Uh, but on the flip side, I've also had people say, wait, but they're just going to ask me for that all the time. And then they seem really disappointed that they have to do this extra work. Although when I remind them, well, you, they can ask for attention that you then give them or they can hit you and tantrum a lot. I mean, I you could pick which do you prefer of those two? You know, right. I don't need I don't need to set up an elaborate experiment. They usually yeah. answer the uh, please don't let the kids hit me right uh, response. so true yeah i i don't know what research there is on this topic we'd have to do a little lit review i think to figure that out i don't know if there is some out there but anecdotally i have often seen that behavior therapists seem to prefer to do the types of activities with kids where the kids are successful right so if it's a really difficult or challenging program or one that's likely to produce problem behavior or is complicated to run, or that the child's not making progress on, those types of programs don't get run. That is so true. Right? Mm-hmm. In those situations, the teacher, if, if we make a leap to say that student progress is a reinforcer for our mm-hmm. therapist, which I think, it, I think it really is for most of us in this field, yeah. then if we make that little bit of a leap, then we could say that the teachers are also preferring the situations in which their behavior is most effective and is meeting the most right. reinforcement, too. So that it might apply in that, that way. That would be interesting to look at. It would be. Yeah. 
thesis. I feel like I like it's on the tip of my tongue. What I don't know if I've just talked about this with people a lot, or if I've actually read something on it. So I don't want to be stealing someone's research if they've actually done That's it. Thunder. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure either. I'll try and find that out. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. So this is an awesome article, and it made way for even more awesome articles. Well, before we get into any of those future awesome articles, we're going to jump forward in time to a little follow-up. But let's take a little break before we do that. We'll be right back. Hey, ABA Inside Trackers. It's me, Jackie. And it's me, Diana. Jackie, I'm really excited to be joining you in this commercial because I've also started my career path at Regis. Yay! Yes, that's right, folks. If you want to start an exciting career in applied behavior analysis, you should check out the Master's and Certificate Program in Applied Behavior Analysis at Regis College. You can learn from both Diana and me. Here are some interesting facts about our program. 90% of our 2016 graduates passed the BCBA exam during their first time taking the exam. We think this is a really great testament to the program. We started an on-campus autism center in fall 2017. The center provides behavior analytic services to children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder right at Regis College. The center will offer employment opportunities for some of our graduate students. Students working at the center will receive partial tuition remission. We also offer opportunities for paid clinical placements and graduate assistantships starting in the student's first year. So all of our grad students are currently working in the field, either part-time or full-time. Yes, we help students identify their practicum placements because we think it's imperative students receive excellent training and experience in the application of behavior analysis. Therefore, we screen placements to ensure students receive high-quality practicum placements. We are approved by the BACB to provide intensive practicum. Students complete at least 750 hours, but most complete much more over the course of three semesters. Across that time, students complete a professional portfolio that includes completing a variety of application exercises, such as conducting assessments, developing behavior plans, training curriculum, and more. This portfolio functions as a way to ensure students are learning the essentials of being an effective behavior analyst and is a great way to showcase your work at job interviews upon graduation. I love it. Students enroll in two courses per semester and graduate in a little under two years. Our courses are offered in traditional classroom and hybrid formats, which enables a student to focus on one course at a time while still completing the program quickly. All of the faculty are PhD level BCBAs with strong applied and research backgrounds in ABA and all have published papers in respected peer-reviewed journals. We ensure small class sizes so that all students receive personalized attention from their professors and advisors are easily accessible to meet with students. There is also an invited lecture series at Regis, which involves inviting outside experts in ABA to speak on specialized topics relating to practicing ABA. And these are really great opportunities for students to learn from a variety of experts in the field in addition to their professors. And last summer we completed an international service trip to Iceland, which we plan to do every other year. Although we train students to work effectively with individuals diagnosed with autism, we also have opportunities for students to work with individuals with a variety of diagnoses and typically developing individuals as well. In addition, the coursework covers the broad applications of ABA with respect to solving socially important problems. There are opportunities for students to be involved in faculty research as well. We have a great location. We're just 12 miles from the center of Boston. So check us out at www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Keep responding. And we are back. Welcome back. We are going to continue our talk about do humans or organisms. We, We couldn't choose which one we wanted to call it prefer contingencies and we are gonna start this return back by 
sharing one of our secret code words. Yes, that's right. For those of you who don't know, the ABA Inside Track podcast is ACE approved. So by listening to this, you too can apply for continuing education credits through our website. There's a link in the show notes or you can go to abainsidetrack.com. You'll definitely need to have two secret code words that we sprinkle in this episode. And we're going to give you the first one right now. And it is TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. Tulip. It is a flower. Which flower is it? It's the one. It's like yellow. It's usually yellow, Sometimes right? Sometimes it's yellow or pink? red. Could be pink. Sometimes, Maybe. yeah. They, where, yeah. Are they, where are they from? Holland. Yes. Is that where they're usually? Yes. Considered to be from Holland, or that's where, considered. That's to what be we from. Americans allegedly. Think of. Holland allegedly. as having a lot of tulips. Tulip. All right, we're going to jump forward in time to our 2009 article, and Diana, you're going to take us through the discussion yeah. of this article, which extends the previous research and is very i don't know if complicated is the right word there are a lot of moving you, you know you could use moving that word parts in this article one might so, say that so please take us through nice and slow so some of us not me of course but you know some of us <laughs> can understand it a little bit just a little bit better than, than than in their first reading all right i'll do my best so this article is luzinski and hanley's 2009 Paper titled, Do Children Prefer Contingencies? Question mark. An evaluation of efficacy of preference for contingent versus non-contingent social reinforcement during play. It's a long title. Well, it's a long article. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't often, I feel, get articles in Java that are 14 that is full true. pages long with graphs for every participant. Yeah. But you did in this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they loved this article, and I love it too. <laughs> now, now I love it too. I've come to love it. So we've talked about about why you would look at this question, right? So, mm -hmm. do people prefer contingencies? The background for that was laid with your article, Jackie, the ninety seven article. Right. But we only had two participants there, mm -hmm. right? And we're looking at a really specific question of using treatment to address problem behavior and both of the individuals there, despite having two effective treatments, uh, preferred the treatment that was dependent on their responding versus the one where they just got reinforcement for free. Right. right. So that was a great background, but the question here that they wanted to ask was, do they see the same type of effects with a different population, specifically a preschool, preschool aged children mm -hmm. without any type of diagnosis? Right. Uh, and they wanted to see if the that extended to overall levels of social reinforcement as the reinforcer. Okay. And I think that it's it's nice to think about this in this larger context because they set it up. I mean, they're talking about preschool children mm -hmm. and about social reinforcement for them. But they set up this article in such a nice way that I think that it can be used to create parallels across a variety of different populations. Okay. And types of potential treatments too nice right? so like they yeah. like laid the groundwork in making it almost like a generic kind of study mm -hmm. right so that it could potentially be applied in other ways and that's part of why they wanted to look at this question too all right so we already talked about how when you were talking about the difference between for you it was fct and ncr and here yep. we're going to do dra and NCR. Okay. We have a contingent delivery of reinforcement and a non-contingent delivery of reinforcement. Right. right. And that's really the whole key here, right? So does your behavior produce the reinforcer and mm -hmm. you can only access that reinforcer when and only when the behavior is occurring? Or does, is the same amount of reinforcement getting dropped in randomly and independent of your own responding? Which of those two scenarios is preferred right i would imagine i'm just imagining my life and just imagining like money falling from the sky yeah and then or money contingent on my response mm -hmm. i might like money falling from the sky but <laughs> <laughs> i mean we'll have to assess it experimentally but I kind of like that idea, <laughs> just like walking Let's and being assess like, it oh. experimentally, and I think both conditions should be really long, right? Right, very it's a long, really long time to make sure <laughs> that we have stable, yeah, like twenty, maybe twenty so years, twenty years, yeah, <laughs> twenty years with NCR, yep, and, and then, then right, right, I like that, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we'll do a pairwise analysis, but we'll really just do 
one condition for a long, long time and then the other condition for a long, long time. And the control conditions is just, I just get the money. (laughs) (laughs) In one lump sum? Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to start that tomorrow. (laughs) Sounds great. When we're talking about NCR, which is non-contingent reinforcement, which, as you mentioned, is a misnomer. We're not reinforcing a specific behavior. It's more accurately stated as a time-based schedule. The advantage of using something like that to uh, decrease behavior is that it's easy. Right. It is very easy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to monitor the whole time. You don't have to decide whether the behavior did or did not occur. You just provide the reinforcement, provide the preferred item. Right. On some, usually some type of variable time schedule. So it's really easy. The advantage of a DRA, which is what we're going to talk about here, or differential reinforcement of alternative behavior. One advantage I like to mention is that we're training another response, right? right? So we're teaching an alternative teaching behavior, something. which is usually more appropriate. Uh, but there's also the point that's made here is that it's a response dependent contingency. So that may potentially strengthen some other aspect of the individual's repertoire, right? right? Yep. Which is kind of another way to say what I already said. So there were eight participants in this study. They were all between the ages of three years and seven months and five years and four months. And they attended a preschool. Uh, None of them had a diagnosis. And their names were Amy, Sia, D, Sam, Ted, Beth, Lou, and Ed. I love those names. They're like Fred Flintstone Mm -hmm. names. Yeah, they really are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Uh, Just like in your study, Jackie, they are going to do some work with those initial links, right, to access yep. the terminal links. And those initial links are going to be different colored pieces of paper. Sure. Right? So before they did anything else, and this is how you know that this is a Greg Hanley study. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also, folks, this is how you get your stuff published in Java, if that's your goal, mm-hmm. is they did a color preference assessment. I love that. Yeah. Right? Because these are preschoolers, and you... If you ask any preschooler, they are going to have very strong opinions Mm -hmm. about what their favorite color is. Absolutely. And if you have accidentally picked their favorite color as one of these three colors that you're going to have as your initial links, you could get responding towards that color regardless of the terminal link contingency that it's supposed to be representing. Or the opposite, where they hate a color. True. And they may never respond to that color because they hate it so much. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. As we know, most preschoolers hate-filled, hate-filled little things. They are. <laughs> it's joyless. Especially on color. <laughs> oh, brown. Brown is probably not anyone's favorite. It's mine. Well, it is now as an adult. Was it when you were a kid? I like brown when I was a kid. Yeah. Because dogs right, are brown. guys. You fine. Get, I had a Super Mario Brothers coloring book, and there's a lot of brown in the original Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> yeah, there was. Dogs are brown. It's my third favorite color, but it, it wasn't when I was a kid. Mm, that's fair. So they did a color preference assessment, and from that, they picked just the moderately preferred colors Smart. for each of the kids. So they had different colors for each child. Yeah. But yeah, guys, like that's how thorough they were. Mm-hmm. And you should be too. Right. If you're doing this. But so don't do this because they won't publish it. They already published it once. <laughs> it's already been published, and it, was, and it was very well done and very thorough. So, you know, maybe work on something else. Extension. <laughs> I did it without a color preference assessment. So I am. <laughs> I didn't control for very much extension. in my article. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> to extend if this worked, if you didn't do a good job. That's pretty funny. I just did my research on color preferences of preschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> Winning. What did we learn? Nothing. <laughs> Everyone loves or hates pink. <laughs> uh, so then there were two pieces of the study. And within each piece, there were two things that they did. Within each piece, they did what was called an efficacy evaluation and a preference assessment. Love it. So within the efficacy evaluation, they exposed the children to the contingencies that they were looking at within that particular part of the study, right, by telling them what the rules were related to that and then having them go into the the room and experience those contingencies. Okay, so these efficacy sessions were each three minutes when they went in and exposed them to the contingencies, but they might do several of those right right throughout the day. Within those sessions, they were looking to see a differentiation or stable responding within each of the conditions that they were looking at. And I'm going to explain what conditions are in a second. I'm trying to 
set up mm-hmm. the arrangement first. Mm-hmm. Okay. The background. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that was the efficacy evaluation. And it's called that because they wanted to see to see are these contingencies that we have in place working. Right. Makes <laughs> sense. Right? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So they did that first. And then they did the preference assessment. And that happened just almost exactly like how you described in your study, Jackie. So they had the initial link and the terminal link. The initial link were the color cards that they had that were had been previously associated with the different conditions or contingencies. They had to place those out. Uh, they had the child select which one, and mm-hmm. then they experienced that contingency. Right, and they also had a control condition as well. Yeah. For this one as well, like just like mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so those are the two pieces. And then, like I said, there were two parts. So the first part was a comparison between continuous reinforcement and no reinforcement. So those two different conditions were experienced in the efficacy evaluation, and then the child had the opportunity to select one, and that part was to determine the preference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So the response that they were using in this first part was saying the first experimenter's first name, which was Kevin. Kevin, I love this one time I was reading this in class and someone's like, why did they pick Kevin? And yeah, I was right? like, guys, look at the author's name. It was know, amazing. It, it does seem so random right? that it's just Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> but I know why they did it. And yeah. you can easily figure it out if you read the authors right. on the study. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. it's Kevin. Yeah. It's Kevin. Yeah. But I so. just thought that was funny. Like, why did they pick Kevin? <laughs> Such a random name. That seems so random. Yeah. It's like, with the, isn't that the name of the bird and up? Isn't that what they named the bird, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Is. That is. Wow. <laughs> Obscure reference. Good work. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, that movie was nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award, Jackie. Sorry, I haven't seen it yet. What? What? I know. I have. I'm sorry. What year is that? I don't know. I'm shocked you don't Same know. Same year as the Hurt Locker. I know. I know. I saw the Hurt Locker. Well, that won the Best Picture Academy Award. I didn't even. Rob like does it. not approve. Yeah, I didn't even like it. It was it was a fine movie. It was not good as as good as Up. Are we looking that up now? Or? Yeah, you guys can. <laughs> we're good. Two thousand nine. That's what happened in two thousand nine. <laughs> the same year as this study. <gasps> oh my God, you guys! You know what we should do? We should start an urban myth that the reason they used Kevin as their target <laughs> response was because in honor of the movie Up. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I love it. Shh. Not because the first author's name nope. is Kevin. No. They love no. that movie up. That must be why. Okay. <laughs> so the idea here is that they were teaching an attention-seeking response. So the context was they brought the child into the room. Uh, they, you know, initially showed the child several toys. The child mm-hmm. selected one. They had those toys available to play with during the session. And in the continuous reinforcement condition... They, they did practice initially so that the child had the opportunity to learn what to do. But following that, once uh, they were in the room and they were playing with the toys, the child, anytime they said, Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> the, first author. the first author who ran the study, gave the child his full attention. So he said, oh, hey, what's up, buddy? You know, He's very uh, anim- animated he as well. He is super so, animated. So it probably was a good amount of attention. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. high quality attention. I have absolutely... No doubt. Right, me neither. Right. Uh, So the instruction was, if you say, Kevin, I can talk to you and I can play with you. And he did so, right? Or uh, So he also gave both vocal attention and non-vocal attention. So nodding, smiling, making eye contact, et cetera, right? So it's a high-quality attention experience. So in the continuous reinforcement condition that was available every time, the child said, Kevin. And then in the no reinforcement condition... No social attention was available. Great. That was probably hard no for Kevin. No matter what. It's probably I so know. hard for Kevin. Right? Kids are probably like, Kevin! Guy! Guy! Mm-hmm. It's really hard to ignore children. <laughs> it really is. Right. So the, the experimenter had something to read with him, and he just did read, read just that. Just read them. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was the initial efficacy evaluation for CR, which is continuous reinforcement, versus no reinforcement. Okay. Differentiation of responding was shown in seven out of eight participants. Mm-hmm. It was Lou. Lou is had, our wild card, had guys. Some trouble with this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised though. Why? 
So a couple of my thesis students have looked to replicate a small aspect of this study, yeah. trying to determine whether social attention is a reinforcer for young children, preschool age children, and for some of them, they have not been able to evaluate that. So they always chose the no the no reinforcement condition, which is hilarious. We'll have to look into that further. What are you going to do? I know. I just looked, and Lou is also the youngest participant. Oh. Okay. I your, think I'm probably yeah. I'm probably jumping age. ahead of myself because we have more to say about Lou. Mm-hmm. But he was a three-year, seven-month-old mm-hmm. one, and, and we everyone were, else was older. And we were using th- two- and three-year-olds. Right. Oh. We're so that something. might be part of it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, but for everyone else, they saw a really clear differentiation between number of Kevins per minute. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> that's actually what the graph is, guys. It's mm. Kevins per minute. Uh, in the continuous reinforcement condition, when social interaction was the reinforcer, and in Kevins per minute, in the no reinforcement condition, when there was no reinforcement available. So once they saw that level of differentiation, they moved on to the preference assessment portion for this first study, in which they had... The two links available, continuous reinforcement, no reinforcement. The child selected one of the links and then experienced that contingency. The most important part here was the initial link selection, because that's how you determine preference. And for eight out of eight participants, they selected the continuous reinforcement link more Almost to the exclusion of ever selecting the no reinforcement condition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what we know from that is that we don't know that children prefer contingencies from that. But we know that children prefer receiving reinforcement versus receiving no reinforcement. With Kevin. When Kevin is the reinforcer. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And you're typically developing preschooler. But the question was, do children prefer contingencies? Right. We didn't ask that yet. No, not yet. So that's the next thing that we're going to do. Okay? Awesome. I love following this journey with you. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I want to lay it out because it's complicated. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the study, you might be turned off from it. And I don't want that because it's really cool the way that they did it. So I want to make sure that everyone's along for the ride. So part two. Now we've taught everyone to say Kevin to access the reinforcer. But we're going to switch it up. You can think of this as well as a parallel to having a problem behavior that's been reinforced okay. on probably a continuous reinforcement schedule, right? right? And mm-hmm. now you're putting that behavior on extinction and you're teaching some type of alternative response. Okay. That makes okay? a lot more sense. It yeah. does, mm-hmm. right? Okay. So before we had Kevin, Kevin was now occurring at a high rate because it had been reinforced. Right. During study two, Kevin is going to be put on extinction and a new response, a new attention getting response of... Excuse me. I love that. Is now going to be produce the reinforcer. Sure. Makes All right. sense. Yeah. And for those of you who might be confused by looking at the figures, why is excuse me on those first couple graphs? It is so that there's a comparison now in this phase in which they actually would like to see a change in the rate of excuse me's per minute. Right. I had that question because I said, why would you put Of course, they're gonna, kids aren't going to say excuse me. They're not very polite. But they might, age. though. They might, but most... Three to five, Jaggy, saying excuse me spontaneously. Right. Well, one of them did, and I actually forgot to bring that up related to the first part of the study. So D said, uh, excuse me, Kevin, every mm-hmm. time. So mm-hmm. if you take a look at her graphs, you see responding in the excuse me, excuse me per minute, and Kevin per minute is actually the same mm-hmm. because she chained those two together. And that happens. I mean, like maybe her parents really value um, social niceties, right? Yeah. So there's there's some young kids I know that always say excuse me and it's super cute. It's like excuse me, <laughs> right? It's one of eight. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> one of eight. I know. Twelve percent of children. <laughs> I don't know if it's problematic that some kids might know excuse me, and some wouldn't, right? So they all had the right. opportunity to experience the contingencies beforehand and right. the opportunity to learn the response. I don't think it's a they're at a disadvantage if they did already know the response. I don't really think it has implications for the study. I don't think so either. Only because there was they didn't like put if he if she said excuse me Kevin, it wasn't like then Kevin no longer provided attention. Mm. Right. Yeah, I think it would be more problematic if they had used excuse me in study one and then tried to extinguish right and yes. then taught Kevin. I agree. Right, because there's a 
for some students, a longer history of reinforcement with excuse me. So it's not what they did. So they're right. one ahead of the game there yeah. already. They could have also used Mr. L mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for Luzinski instead of excuse me. But they didn't do that. So don't get confused. They used excuse me. All right. So in it's not really study two, but that's when you can think of it almost as that part. Well, we're now going to reinforce excuse me. Uh, the same arrangement was set up. We had efficacy evaluations and preference assessment. But now, it's no longer just continuous reinforcement. Now we're looking at the comparison between response-dependent and response-independent contingencies. The response-dependent contingency was a DRA. Mm -hmm. The alternative response was excuse me. Yes. Right? Saying Kevin no longer produces reinforcement anymore. That's on extinction. Excuse me produces reinforcement so now it's it's the dra it's the alternative response so that's kind of the parallel between problem behavior and teaching a functional replacement behavior so we have a dra condition our response independent condition is ncr so just like what you did jackie yep and i mean you didn't do it i wish i did we talked about it yeah Yeah. so that's a non-contingent reinforcement and they did the same idea they yoked it together Mm -hmm. so whatever the rate of reinforcement was in the preceding dra condition they provided the same level of reinforcement in the ncr condition and then there was an extinction condition as well, in which neither Kevin nor, excuse me, produced access to the reinforcer. Cool? Yeah. Sounds great. Love it. Love it. Great. So the FC evaluation, they compared these three. They looked for uh, steady rates of responding, ideally with some level of differentiation. During the FC evaluation, they saw that for their participants. Once that was established, they moved on to the preference assessment, which again, they you know, was, they were interested to see what they did, but they were really interested in that initial link selection because that's how they determine preference. Here there were three comparisons, the NCR, the DRA, and the extinction. What they yeah. find. So for everyone, with the exception of Lou, Lou gosh, Lou. <laughs> seven out of eight participants uh, saw higher levels of responding in the DRA condition for excuse me during the FSC evaluation than the in the other two conditions. And once they moved into the preference assessment, they had higher response allocation to the DRA condition in their initial link selection than they did either the NCR or the extinction conditions. So that would demonstrate that seven out of eight participants preferred contingencies, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They preferred when the same amount of reinforcement was available for their actual engaging in the response and it was just freely dropped on their plate. Now, Lou is, again, our youngest participant. So in study one, his responding was variable, right? Between the extinction, I'm sorry, the the no reinforcement condition and the contingent. Continuous reinforcement condition. Continuous reinforcement condition, yeah. So it's possible he was having some difficulty discriminating between when reinforcement was and was not available. Because Mm -hmm. in the no reinforcement condition, his responding was actually much higher. Very high. Right? So that... So he was like, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. He's probably like right in his face. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So he was was relatively young. So Mm -hmm. perhaps he hadn't picked up on what was happening there. However, in the the follow-up, the NCR DRA extinction comparison, they did do some further analysis and found that there might have been some adventitious reinforcement happening for Lou during the NCR condition. Oh. So there were, when they looked at the last three sessions of the NCR condition for all participants, generally the times when the social interaction occurred did not immediately follow bids for attention right. by, the, mm-hmm. by the child, but for Lou it happened to. Ooh, right? Yeah. So likely that contributed to the establishment of that response in that condition sure. and just thoroughly confused him. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, as far right? as whatever was going He's on. like, what is going on, yeah. Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, I thought we were friends. <laughs> uh, so for Lou, uh, there seems like there was a lot happening that may have muddled mm-hmm. the contingencies for him and really made his data overall unclear. Right. However, for everyone else, there was really a clear preference that they really mm-hmm. did prefer the contingencies. Yeah. And so this was just a nice exten- extension of the previous research and a new way to look and think about our behavior and the value that it may have when it encounters reinforcement. Right. 
mm-hmm. dependent versus independent of contingency. One thing I love is that they still included lose data, right? Yeah. So they could have just said like, oh, we didn't see great effects. Let's not include Lou. Um, but I like that they did because it highlights um, the importance of really looking back at your session data to see what's going on. So mm-hmm. doing that further analysis, if you're a clinician, like a hot clinician and using this for your, you know, for this evaluation for your, your clients, um, if you don't see differentiation, go back and see what's going on and not just be like, oh, it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, right. You know, like, no, <laughs> bummer. Um, but go back and see. And then you could potentially put a limited hold on the reinforcer, right? So if contingent on their response, you would wait five seconds. Following mm-hmm. their response in order, and then provide that, and then provide that preferred item, mm-hmm. so that it wouldn't always it wouldn't follow that specific response. Yeah. yeah, but that's another way that they could have moved forward with with this if they hadn't found it out. If they had found it out during the time that they were looking, they could have done that. They did not do an FA beforehand to determine if social interaction was reinforcing, right? Yeah, or and that's okay. Assessment, I guess. Not an FA, but it was, and they determined that through their experimentation. Right. Right. Yeah. So sometimes you don't need everything because the questions that you're asking, the answers are found out within the experimental design. Right. Yeah. They pretty much covered it all. Yeah, they really did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is such a cool study. Good. All right. Well, now that we've gone over both of these articles, and we've kind of come to a, a reasonable, I think, conclusion about humans preferring contingencies for majority over over the majority let's go into our dissemination station and talk a little bit about about what this would mean to the practitioner hey there hey welcome to dissemination station that's not creepy i know Uh, i've been trying to get murdered at this station (laughs) let's move on to the next one you will be murdered here um one thing disembark (laughs) Please take off your arms. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. That's... <laughs> That's dumb. I think this is really helpful for uh, clinicians to think about because, again, what I said before, I think it's nice to think about client preference, but it also be important to look at therapist preference um, to see if there's any effects on looking at whether therapists prefer running um, treatments to see if they're more or less likely to correctly implement the procedures. Um, because I've I've found like, at least anecdotally that if someone doesn't, if there's no buy-in, right? So if there's no buy-in on why we're running the procedures, then they just don't run them, mm-hmm. which is right. fun, which is interesting. I know I've done it probably. I want to come at it from the perspective of looking at client preference for treatment. Okay. So I'm, you know, let's say I'm in an environment where I have a huge caseload. I'm lucky if i'm doing you know quality functional analyses on my clients sure much less even just like a like a half-ass descriptive assessment okay and now i'm also responsible for doing something more than just well we've got these different treatment options do you have one that sounds good to you child and maybe mom and dad i'm not saying that to be flippant and say we it's not worth doing sure but if i'm gonna do that as as a practitioner not necessarily me, but you know, the speaking for right the the, majo- the majority of of the practitioner, the majority of folks who are, who are just practicing. What would you say would be the most efficient way to carry out the concurrent links schedule? You know, how could I do it in such a way that it was kind of quick and it gave me results that I felt relatively confident were giving me the information I needed? Or could I say, well, there have been two really great studies saying that people like to choose, you know, contingency treatments. So I'm just going to overgeneralize that and say, you know, uh, what is it? What was it? 80, 88%? You know, my odds are good if I just pick the one where they're picking a <laughs> contingency. I'm probably getting, I'm probably hitting what they prefer. Um, I think it's going to be client specific, to be honest. So if you have a very complex case with maybe, you know, a younger child or maybe um, clients that have lower understanding of contingencies like you know what i mean with the have severe intellectual impairments there you i think more difficulty discriminating yes please thank you yeah (laughs) Yeah, so there i think you may you may want to do an assessment just because you 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 can't gleam from these results right so that's where 
we saw the drop. But otherwise, I think you could. And then you, you could use the response-dependent treatment. And you could do a quick analysis like you do your trial-based FA, mm-hmm. right? So you could do it really fast. Maybe just take – it's only two minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So you could run a program, do it quick, fast for two minutes across a day, and then just look at your data. You could have like what? Like if you did one trial every hour – that's six data path, just six data points. Mm-hmm. So you could look at that really fast, right? So one day, you you could have that, and yeah. then you could go back to that like a, every month or every other month, and just keep assessing whether the treatment is still yeah. Preferred. As long as you take the time initially to establish the two treatments, right? Right, like that, yeah. I think that's the part that takes the that's most time, be hard. right? So I, like the efficacy evaluation piece, right. where they had to run that out to yeah. stability. Yeah, mm-hmm. but then realistically, if I'm still getting, you know, okay, I did this, I get my, you know, I get the treatment that that the client prefers, and I'm getting low rates of problem behavior. The odds that it would ever get looked at again, unless those rates went up, are slim to none. Yeah, that's true. I'm just You're like, right. oh, thank God, I got more than myself in this tiny contained little space right. to <laughs> run this treatment successfully. Oh, yeah. I'm. Oof, that's hard enough. So yeah, I think if you have students that are, you know, that you could just ask them too, well, right? Yeah, certainly. If you're working with older students, you could just ask you them. You should probably just ask them. Mm-hmm. You could ask them, or you could do some like picture card quickly, you know, mm-hmm. training right there. But I think you know, I mean, there's only two data pass but you could also see if you could look adje- uh, subjectively too right so you could observe the client just like you have to right as a bcba observe the client experiencing the con- experiencing the contingency experiencing the treatment and look for signs of indices of happiness or indices of unhappiness um are they smiling mm-hmm. are they freaking out are mm-hmm. they you know like so you could do that too even mm-hmm. though it's not as objective that might be one way, you know, as long as you operationally define what you're going to be looking for. That could be one way mm-hmm. that you do it quickly because you don't have time, right, to run mm-hmm. to run out this. I think when you might be asking this question is when you have the time. Yeah. To ask, right. So if right. you're dealing with really severe problem behavior, you're right, Rob. Once you have that under control, that's the most important thing, right, mm-hmm. that you're keeping the client and everyone else safe but let's say you're looking at stereotypy redirection and you have a couple different options as far as what seem to be effective treatments that might be a situation where you do take the time to expose them to both treatments color code them run them at different portions of the day and then once you've established the difference between those two then yeah like you said every once in a while every hour offer them the opportunity to do the red or the yellow yeah and then take data in that regard because mm-hmm. it's less high stakes. And I I would really want client input, I think, if mm-hmm. I were doing stereotype redirection on what yeah. they actually preferred. Mm-hmm. So. But yeah, if you're right in the case of severe problem behavior. That is not your first priority. No. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another question. How many extensions do you think it would take in which you get a replication of these results to some, you know, to, to a pretty high extent before we could make the blanket statement, humans almost always prefer having that choice, having that contingency in place. Therefore, let's just say if you have a choice between the two, you know what? Go with the treatment that has a choice component in it or that contingency in it. And if it doesn't work out, okay, then go back and take the other one. Is there ever a point at which we get to that? You know, I think about that sometimes with stereotypy where it's sure. like, it's probably going to be automatic reinforcement. <laughs> right. I could do an assessment. You know, there's some brief ones, but you're like, do we really want to spend the two, three hours on that? We, we kind of all know where it's going to go. And you do because there's nothing saying, right. you know, nope. And, and we've all agreed it's got to be this. Because it's not always. It's, it's not, it's not always. 20%. Might not be. Yeah, it's 20%. I don't think it's that high. I feel like I saw a much higher in the literature. I like I, yeah, like I saw a ninety percent in the literature not too long ago. No, twenty percent might be some other function, right? Or, or multiple other function, multiply maintained. Yeah. So eighty you percent. You say ninety. I'm saying eight. It's the same. Close. Ish. Those are two two different. They're really close numbers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so close. But eighty percent. What was your question? 80, okay, so so if if we had extension upon extension, upon oh, oh, extension, okay. right? So and like I said before, this is also building on other past research Mm -hmm. that was done in more of a laboratory setting we we talked about choice way back when with uh with dr carcino we did we did that was episode nine and they did a concurrent change arrangement Mm -hmm. yeah yep 
But there is evidence for a, a longer body of research in just these two articles that organisms prefer mm-hmm. contingencies. And there is a name for that as well, which is contra freeloading. Ooh, oh my God. name. I yeah, like it. Was yeah. in the article, and I had to read it a couple times. Back. So which one's the which one's the choice one? Because the, they all have freeloading in the word. <laughs> so freeloading would be where you just sit on your couch and get things. Like you think of a freeloader. A freeloader. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You get things for free, right? Which is my favorite time of day when I get things for free while I'm mm-hmm. sitting on the couch, you know. But the idea is that, that over over time, that's right. not your overall preference. We prefer yeah. to have our behavior be effective and meet mm-hmm. with contingencies so the uh the term for that is contra freeloading so it's the opposite of free lo- freeloading mm-hmm. so in the end you don't really want to just be a freeloader all the time right. you want for your behavior to have meaning mm-hmm. you want your life to have purpose i feel like and- they should have called it a cost loader or an expense loader to make it very clear that it was the opposite and that confuses me more i no. like contra freeloading i just assume it works yeah it was, it's a very weird term. I just want to know that before uh, any of this research on this, Skinner actually suggested that this was the case mm-hmm. in his article, The Ethics of Helping People. Mm-hmm. So he said that, you know, sometimes helping people can be a bad thing, right? Because you you may be helping them and you, they, you may be just delivering preferred items on a time-based mm-hmm. schedule. And so they're actually not learning anything and contacting the natural contingencies in the, re- in, in the environment. So it may be a bad thing. So Skinner was like right on right there. Good job, Skinner. BF. I don't know if anyone's told you this, Skinner, but you actually <laughs> pretty much knew your stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> W-O-W, Skinner. <laughs> but that's a really nice article, too, if you want to go back in time a little bit. Um, the Ethics of Helping People, it's in the book Reflections, if you want to copy. Mm-hmm. Reflections. Yeah. I think that if you had to choose and did not have the opportunity to do this type of assessment, I would go with the response dependent treatment. Yeah. Yeah. And you and you would feel comfortable and I, I, I would feel comfortable saying this is commonly considered the more preferred. Right. And because you could back it up with we're teaching a skill. Oh, right. Yeah. Just when you look at right. all of the advantages of teaching a, an alternative mm-hmm. response versus just providing time based schedule. Right. You you won't necessarily see the decrease of all responding, which sometimes you see with NCR. Mm-hmm. Um, you won't see any collateral response, like collateral emotional responding, which sometimes you may see with NCR when the schedule is thinned. Mm-hmm. Um, and they worry about adventitious reinforcement. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just like we saw with Lou. With Lou. Right. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. yeah. Ooh. Twinsies! <laughs> we so yad together. If you had to choose, I would, I would even based on what we have here, and there's another 2005 study we didn't talk about as well, by Hanley and colleagues, I would feel comfortable going with the response-dependent I would as well. Treatment. Okay. Contingency. So when you can, you should really make that effort to actively, directly assess client's choice of treatment. If you can. However... If it is a situation in which there are multiple barriers keeping you from doing that, the response-dependent treatment is probably more preferred, and there are other benefits to it, so is probably the one you should I agree, pick. and that aligns with our ethical code as well, because any time that we decrease a problem behavior, we should mm-hmm. be teaching mm-hmm. a behavior in its spot, the fair pair rule. That's right. Um, my fave. My fave, so then you're aligning with our ethical code as well, so... Yeah. Yeah. Any cool. other any other disseminating points? No, I don't have any. I think this has application, you know, far reaching outside of the population that we work with I, as well, mm-hmm. right? So there's there's a lot of um oh, yeah. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot. There's a lot of value and respect in uh, providing people with the opportunity to work and access reinforcers no matter you know what their place in life or, or what their ability and i think that this speaks to that so dana what you're saying is it's a real strong indictment on the current welfare system in america <laughs> and you really want to take a hard stance on that i uh it's a hand I mean, up not a handout is what you're saying I, i'm please continue with the conservative viewpoint i would love to hear <laughs> it's more complicated than that right but i think some sort of response that you do have to engage in behavior in order when you're in the current welfare system you do have to engage in behavior 
in order to receive something, right? You have to apply for assistance. You have to meet with people, I believe. Um, I don't actually know. But As a one percenter, Jay does not know how to get welfare. <laughs> I'm definitely not a one percenter. But... <laughs> Um, there is a, there, you, you are engaging in response you have, to gain welfare assistance. However, would once those you, be the responses that would actually then lead right, to main, you engaging in new behavior that's not just maintaining right. continuing on welfare? Yeah. So that's something that we should delve further into, right? But it does have implications. On so a very that, political and divisive podcast where we talk really <laughs> in-depth about this issue. But There's a hard right for right? you. Right? Yes. Um, I'm <laughs> in a hard left you. So they call um, me. Just kidding. Hard right. <laughs> But I think that would be interesting, though, to, yeah, let's hard you know, left instead. Right. I'm hard left. <laughs> um, but I think that would be interesting to, to look at, you know, like what what would that look like? How might there be changes in our current, you know, political system and our societal system? Right. There's a, that would have to be a big, huge change. Um, but how and what what would those behaviors specifically be? Right. Like we don't know. Right. Like job, what are job seeking behaviors? What are job keeping behaviors? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there's a whole, so many factors Absolutely. involved there. Yeah. Um, but that would be cool. So somebody should do that. Dear politician. It seems like a bad like sci-fi movie where yeah, like, it everyone's does, on an NCR schedule, <laughs> but this band of freedom fighters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's our, it's our next movie. <laughs> I keep finding next movie ideas oh, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. It's called Let Them Work. Yeah. Let Them Live. It's like a House of Cards, America Works. I don't know watch that. Show. Oh, I didn't watch this. You finally watched the show. We have no idea about. Yes, guys, I'm ahead of the game. Is Kevin Spacey still on that show? No, no, <laughs> he's not. Um, it's not on anymore right now. Oh well. But anyway, okay, cool. That was fun. Is that what you were gonna say? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what I was gonna say, but not in a conservative way. Wink, wink. Not in a conservative <laughs> way, Jack. We, we, we know. We get it. We just don't know. We would have to do a thorough analysis of the responses required in order to see mm-hmm. the long-lasting change that we would expect to want. That we would expect to want. <laughs> to have. <laughs> to have. To know. Great. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode. But before we go, I want to make sure everyone who's listening for continuing education credits is able to identify their second secret code word. And it is butterfly. B-U-T-T-E-R-F-L-Y, like a monarch butterfly or a non-monarch butterfly. Do you know the butterflies fly down to Mexico, the monarch butterflies? Uh They fly very far. I go to a butterfly garden here at Boston's Museum of Science, (laughs) which has not paid me to say that. Butterfly. Yeah, it's a massive migration to Mexico. Yeah. It's really cool. Did you... (laughs) I, I mean, I've only seen it on video, but it's really cool. I saw a picture of it once. Of the All the arrow. way to Mexico. Yeah. All right. Well, that did you want to talk about your experiment results? Oh, yeah. What's your experiment? Oh, I tried this out with my uh, some children that I know, and I got a wildly varied results. But I did not take the time to establish the initial uh, conditions the way that one should have, right? So they just practice them each with them one time and then try to do the initial link selection. But I got, like I said, wildly varying results, including one participant, quote, quote, participant, who uh, chose the extinction condition over all others <laughs> because he could talk uh, unfettered during that. Condition. I think he was confused as to what he was supposed to do. Because <laughs> yeah. he, he and explained it as like, oh, you can talk, say whatever you want. And I think he thought it was funny <laughs> to just start like That's babbling. Funny. Yeah. And I think he was getting social reinforcement from other, well, possibly also automatic reinforcement, but definitely some social yeah, reinforcement so. from the other particip- the quote unquote participants who also happened to just be hanging out in the room at the same time. Yeah. Yes. There and then know. I had one uh, one participant who told me he liked getting the things for free, so he <laughs> chose that condition. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know. Uh, I was a participant. I chose the right one because I I knew Rob, I knew Rob what knew answer what he you was wanted supposed to, have. to do. That's not how you do research. No. So anyway, it was fun, but I don't think uh, I did it. Maybe I don't know if it was quite to the quality of Luzinski and Must Hanley two thousand nine. <laughs> it was Wait, did close, you do a preference but, assessment? I mean, a you color planned preference it for like did 10 not. Minutes, you know, oh. it's probably. <laughs> I know long enough to uh, break a bunch of Smarties into small pieces. Yeah. Is how long it took to plan it. So, but it was fun. Yeah, yeah. it's always fun to conduct research <laughs> in your own house. <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> 
Thanks, everyone at home for listening. ABA Inside Track is a podcast that always loves hearing from you, the listeners. There are a lot of different ways you can do that. You can go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you're listening and leave us a review, which would always be very nice and give us feedback. Or you can share your thoughts or posts or things you think would be relevant to the discussion on our Facebook page, on our Twitter page. And those are just as ABA Inside Track. Or you can just email us directly at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We also want to send out a big thanks to Kyle Sturry, who made the awesome theme song that you heard as our kind of interstitial music in the middle. I also want to make sure I thank Jackie and Diana for their awesome contributions. Thank you, guys, as always. You're welcome. All right. We will be back next week with our preview episode so you can hear about what our next exciting topic will be. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.